welcome to our 20th coronavirus uh, virtual town hall. Uh, we've done 19 of these. Uh, they're all on my website if you want to go back and listen on a topic area that you uh, still have interest in. Uh, this is our uh, effort to try to bring experts together to inform you of things that are happening uh, both about the coronavirus as well as all the impacts it's having, certainly on schools, which is the topic of our uh, conversation today. I know that this call finds many of you in very difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, this pandemic is nothing that we've ever experienced in our lives, and I know that it comes with great hardship, uh, great inconvenience, and uh, it's, it's understandable, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, earnest efforts to try to cope with it as best that we can. Um, I am joined in this conversation by my colleagues in the legislature, Assemblymember Rebecca bauer Cahan and Tim Grayson. Uh, hello to you both. Why don't you say hello so we know you're there. Hello, Senator, and hello, everyone listening. This is Rebecca bauer Cahan, and thanks for joining us. I'm excited to join you, Senator, for this conversation. As you know, I am experiencing distance learning and the struggles of school firsthand as a local school parent. So it's an issue that is near and dear to my heart. So thanks for putting this together. Indeed, and thank you for your partnership. Assemblymember Grayson, are you on the line as well? Yes, I am. And Senator Glazer, thank you so much for putting this together, assembling us, and then connecting us ultimately with the Superintendent of Public Instruction. I think uh, the health and safety of our teachers and our students uh, is first and foremost. But at the same time, we must figure out a way to keep uh, their education at the highest quality possible, even through distance learning or whatever the options are that are out there. So thank you for putting this together. I'm looking forward to a very informative session. Well, we have a great lineup of uh, experts, uh, people smarter than me, about what's happening with our schools. Uh, certainly our state superintendent of public construction, Tony Thurman. Uh, we will also have conversations with uh, Janet Schultz, the superintendent of the Pittsburgh Unified School District, Superintendent Richard Whitmore, who's the head of the Lafayette Unified School District, Superintendent Bowers, head of the Livermore Unified School District, and Ann Katzberg, who is the president of the San Ramon Valley Unified School District Education Association. That's the teachers' union. Uh, as you, uh, as everyone knows, uh, school districts across California are making very tough decisions about whether students should come back uh, into the classroom as the state uh, continues to face uh, the increasing infection levels from this coronavirus. And the, the central question is, can it be done safely? And how, how can it be done? Um, the, uh, this, this comes at a time in which uh, the governor just this week is reclosing a lot of things that had been opened for the last few weeks and, and for the last month, including indoor dining, bars, houses of worship, hair salons, malls, and gyms in, much, in many parts of the state. As I'm sure everyone listening knows that cases, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> cases and rates of hospitalizations have risen sharply. Um, California now has uh, over 330,000 uh, COVID-19 cases and over 7,000 deaths from the virus. Uh, the number of new cases uh, set a record just this week. With uh, We're averaging over 8,000 new cases a day. Now, the governor has asked each of the state's more than 1,000 school districts to determine for themselves whether to reopen their classrooms. School districts in my Senate district, there's 19 of them, are largely starting the school year by offering distance learning, although they're some school districts are exploring some hybrid options, and we're going to talk about those uh, in a moment. Uh, my first guest is our wonderful state superintendent, Tony Thurman. Tony, are you on the line? Let's see if we've got him connected here yet. I think he's still in listen only mode. Superintendent, I think if you press star zero, that'll get you into speaking mode. All right, well, hopefully they can figure that one out as I give a full introduction of the superintendent. Uh, he, has, he hails from a teaching background. His mother was a school teacher, and uh, the superintendent himself taught uh, at Richmond schools before entering politics, uh, where he was elected to the state assembly, and, of course, to, as our state superintendent uh, in 2018. 
Uh, I understand, the Superintendent, you have two daughters who are currently in public schools. Uh, and you also served on a school board, uh, I believe, uh, West Contra Costa Unified uh, School Board. Uh, I know that you received your bachelor's uh, at Temple University, uh, and you earned your master's degree in law and social policy and social work at Bryn Mawr College. And hopefully, with that long introduction, Superintendent Thurman, have you been able to join our conversation? Okay, maybe that's him. Superintendent? Well, while we wait for him to join, uh, and operator, if you can let us know when he has been able to join the call, let me, uh, let me bring in Assemblywoman Rebecca bauer Kahan. You have a couple kids in school right now. How are you coping through all of this? Well, you know, I'm, as like many others, looking forward to seeing what we decide for the fall. I think all of us parents, like you mentioned, want the health and safety of our children and our families to be put first, you know, that is critical. But also we get the essential business of teaching our kids and getting them the social emotional learning and experience they need in grade school. And so that's critical to all of this. So it's an important conversation that's happening. There's so many things to take into consideration. And I really want to give a shout out to all of our local school boards who are, I know, having sleepless nights and working so hard to make the right decisions in what are extremely challenging circumstances and times and to our teachers and our educators who are their partners alongside them in trying to figure out how to best do this. I mean, nothing is ideal, but um, I'm hopeful that we'll figure out a way to get our kids learning and engaged and move forward in a safe way. It's complicated. And Assemblymember Grayson, how are you uh, coping with all this, and how, how is your family? Family is uh, healthy and, and safe. I have a daughter that is entering into her second year in college and dealing with uh, the, kind of the same issue in the sense that there is that uh, the need for distance learning, but then when there are classes such as labs or things like that, how do they, how do they facilitate that in a hybrid type sense where they do what they can distance wise, but then come in for the lab part of it and keep it safe. It's, it's very, as my colleague said, it's very, very challenging with the school boards. What I'm really interested in is seeing how the local school boards and the state can coordinate and complement one another to make sure that our, our students stay first in the conversation when it comes to health and safety and education. Well, these are challenging times. Uh, Assemblywoman, have you found any particular tricks of the trade in terms of guidance for other parents and how you keep your kids engaged and focused? Yeah, you know, I mean, we definitely are working hard at having them engage with their friends, right? Even if that's virtually via Zoom, um, you know, making sure that they do have that connection because it's so critical to keeping them happy and mentally well. And, um, you know, I think that's critical. I found one of the things I'm excited to talk to the superintendent and some of our um, local superintendents about is the place my kids were most engaged, and I think I've heard from fellow parents, and I'm sure many on the line agree, is when they were doing synchronous learning with their teachers, right? So on a Zoom call, engaging with their teacher, that was when my kids were most engaged. And I've got a kindergartner, a second grader, and a fourth grader. They all just finished those grades. And, you know, even my fourth grader is much more self-sufficient. That was when he was most happy and learning. And I think that's a question of how do we get more of that? Because we had so little of it in the spring, and I think parents – and educators want to see more of it, and it's a real challenge given the distance. But um, I think that's the most engaging piece. Well, I want to see if uh, Superintendent Thurman, I have got a text message saying he's trying to get in, and we uh, want to see if he's in the call yet. Operator. Okay, sounds like he is not uh, in yet. Well, let me do this. Let, let me uh, let me invite. Uh, Superintendent uh, Janet Schultz from Pittsburgh, uh, you've, uh, you were, you've been a superintendent there since 2014. Uh, you have a wonderful background in education. Uh, uh, give us a, a, a quick view as we're waiting for Superintendent Thurman. Uh, what, what's the status at Pittsburgh? Good morning. Yes, thank you. So in Pittsburgh, we are going to start in um, full distance learning. And when the health conditions improve, then we would want to transition to a hybrid. We've been planning all summer through a variety of advisory committees with representatives from 
teachers, classified admin, counselors, mental health, planning all summer for both scenarios, knowing that we're going to need to be flexible. Um, but we did have our board meeting last evening, and our board did unanimously support the recommendation to begin our school year in full distance learning. And what, what, what was the hardest uh, issue that you wrestled with uh, as, you, as they, they tried to make this decision? I think everyone um, agrees that the health and safety is you know, the most important thing to keep in mind. And then as soon as you make a decision, you know, of course there's 100 questions of, of what will that look like. And so really firming up the educational experience, um, what the assemblywoman said about having the, the daily interactions is very important. So those are in how do we continue to provide supports for our students with disabilities as well were some of the main issues that, um, you know, we have been grappling with and planning for. And uh, was there a lot of uh, engagement from your community in this decision? To... We did. We've had a lot of community engagement. So throughout the summer um, with the various committees, we've also done some webinars early on, got some surveys, you know, webinars for parents and families to update them on things change so quickly you know, get their feedback, present various scheduling options, have them weigh in. Um, and so that's been very helpful in planning. And we've been planning for both all along. We were first focused more on the in-person hybrid. That's a unique learning, you know, um, challenge in scheduling that, but been planning for both all along. And of course now we will work on the details of starting in the full distance learning. But we've had some great community engagement through surveys, through polls, and then of course public comment at our board workshops and board meetings. Well, we've gotten a lot of questions from parents and from teachers. And for those listening, if you'd like to ask some questions, uh, please you can still submit them and we'll try to get them asked as we go here. But uh, Trish uh, asked the question about access to the internet, uh, computers, remote learning, that if that's the, the the pathway uh, that the school districts are going to go in, how can we ins uh, ensure that all the uh, kids are able to connect and have the, the means to connect? Did you guys talk about that, and, and what are you doing in Pittsburgh about that issue? That is a huge issue for us, and we're, we ordered significant numbers of Chromebooks, so we, we did um, sort of emergency orders when this first happened in order to get devices to our families. We've um, done more orders. Um, I'm hopeful that we will get some more or some um, assistance from the state as well too. But we purchased significant numbers of Chromebooks so that we can check those out. Um, we did check them out, and then we're going to have to check out more as we stay in this distance learning so that every child has a device. In terms of internet access, we are um, working with internet providers to try and expand the access and get some hotspots to families who do not have internet access. And so you had some experience with this in this, uh, the spring as the school year ended. Were, were you able to determine how many kids were not getting engaged, not getting their assignments, not re being responsive? Do you have some a sense of that? We um, kept track of our students and, and who were engaged in, in um, with our with our teachers, and we had about 15 percent, I would say, who I would consider were not engaged, um, and so that was very concerning. We had multiple efforts in terms of reaching out to families and trying to do some home visits as well, too, to make sure that we could um, connect, you know, with all of our families, including our homeless and our foster youth families as well, too. So we did do a lot of outreach efforts, and we will continue to do, those, do so. We had about 15% of our students who were not regularly engaged. Uh, Assemblywoman, you have a question? Well, I just wanted to add something that you know the superintendent brought up, which is the, the districts need to start spending money, right? which we all know listening to this call is people engaged in education in our communities is so tight in our school districts. 
on these devices and these hotspots and getting kids equipped in a way that they weren't anticipating. And so, um, you know, she mentioned hoping that there will be movement from the state in support. And I wanted just to let everyone on the call know and the superintendent know that we are carrying a bill that would um, ensure that there's about $25 million coming from the PUC that will get to our school districts to help buy those exact things, the computers, the hotspots, the things that will get our students connected because the legislature and the state know that without the devices to connect, distance learning can't happen for all of our students. And equity and learning across all students is so critical. So that digital divide has to be closed and we have to be there to support you fiscally because your budgets aren't able to absorb the immense cost that goes into buying that. So we are working on it and hopefully that bill will pass out of the Senate and get you those dollars you need. So we're Thank you, Assembly Member. Great. This is uh, this is Tony Thurman. Uh, oh, Superintendent Good morning, Thurman. Senator. Thank you very much. We were, just we were just speaking with Superintendent Janet Schultz from Pittsburgh, and Janet, we're going to come back to you in just a few minutes. But I want, want to welcome our State Superintendent Tony Thurman. Thank you. Sorry about the technical problems of getting you in. Not but a it's problem, great, Senator. Great it's, it's, it, the, the, the subject was about devices, and I think the experiences that we have reflect what our students and families are dealing with um, in terms of connectivity. So I, uh, I appreciate uh, the, 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 the uh, circumstances, but I also appreciate you having all of us on today. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time. And look, I, we're going to talk about a serious subject, but I always like you know people know us by names and uh, but not really the, with any depth but i wanted to say i know that you're struggling as we all are to to cope with this running the the school system of the state as well as taking care of your family how, how is it going for you personally uh, uh senator as you can imagine uh, as you heard from me from the colleagues from the legislature everyone in california in this nation in this world is affected by it and um, I really want to start by commending the resilience of our students and their families and our educators, uh, and, and I mean that broadly, administrators, everyone. This is really, as you said earlier, Senator, I was listening. I heard everything, and I agree with you. This is probably the toughest experience that most of us will encounter in our lifetime, and it comes at a time when there are very few clear answers about how to really combat something uh, for which there's not a whole lot of data. The science isn't completely settled, but there are some things that we do know that can keep us safe, and we're working on those things. It's been tough. The pandemic has been tough for all children, including my own. Um, lots of questions about the unknown, lots of fears about you know getting sick, and, of course, just not having contact with friends and peers and teachers. And so we share all those concerns, and what we try to do at the, district, at the Department of Education is work with all the great superintendents that you have on this call. Um, I've, I've just heard really great things about efforts to connect the students, you know, uh, you know, making sure, as a member member, uh, 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 Bauer-Kayon said, having live contact between a teacher and a student is so important. Um, if, if all we have right now is, is remote or distance learning, uh, that is important. I, I hear from students and teachers who tell me that their students are already on the line before the class even starts when we were in distance learning before the summer broke, meaning that's important. Uh, we need to have, as I say, we have to take care of the three pillars. First and foremost, keep everybody safe. Second, we've got to address the social-emotional learning needs of all of our students. And finally, we have to make sure that there is continuity of learning, good standards around distance learning, and training and professional development. Let's face it, we all went into distance learning overnight. Uh, with no playbook on how to do that. Remote learning was not the way in California. It is now, for now, anyway, for now. It's part of the way. And uh, we've got to now, we have an opportunity to make sure that if we find ourselves in distance learning again, we make it stronger and we make sure we address equity and we address learning loss and we offset those issues. And there's a whole bunch of things I'd love to tell you about, Senator, but I'm going to wait until you you cue me on where you want me to go, and uh, we're happy to share. Well, there is a lot to talk about, and I know that uh, under your leadership, you've been uh, working really hard with your team to provide guidance to, to school districts that are wrestling with this decision. You know, the, the the big question is that you know I think a lot of districts would love to get stronger guidance from the state to say you should open or you should not open, and the idea of, of putting this choice in their hands has created a lot of complexity and uncertainty and worry, um, and I'm sure you hear that too, and I know the governor has gotten that question quite a bit. Um, why aren't you telling all of us to only go remote learning or to do something different? 
well, how, how would you, what would you say to that in terms of uh, leadership from the top versus the, you know, the input and the, and the wisdom from, from the school districts themselves? You know, I'll speak for myself, Senator, and then uh, I'll, I'll say what I think is happening as it relates to the governor and your, your inquiry. Um, you know, I can just say this, that um, ultimately uh, safety is paramount. If schools had to open tomorrow, I don't think that most of our districts are in a place where things would be safe enough to do so. And I've said that publicly, and I've said that I respect districts like the ones on this call that have made the decision to move into distance learning. Uh, the, the, you know, one of the key metrics uh, for us is, is the percentage of cases uh, of COVID infection in, in any particular community. And in many communities in our state, the, the, the infection rate is just so high that we should not risk the safety of our children, the safety of their educators, the safety of the, of the students' families. And, and so for now, um, as we're seeing, many districts are planning to open in, district, in, district, in distance learning as a precaution. Um, does it mean that we may not find that the conditions are better later where we can move to in-person instruction? I think as uh, Assembly Member Grayson said it, um, we have to balance safety, um, but anything that we can do to create the opportunity for students to be able to learn um, in person, anything we can do to support the families who have to go back to work, we have to look for it. But none of that can come at the safety uh, and the well-being of our students and their educators. And so, so for now, we find ourselves in a position uh, of largely needing to open uh, in distance learning. With the exception of a few counties, there are a few counties that find themselves with very, very low rates of of, of COVID infection, and they have space. They have something that many of the districts on this call don't have the luxury of having. I'm a neighbor, you know, as you mentioned, I, you know, you know, not far. I'm in the Bay Area too, in East Bay, and and I know that our districts, you know, for them to maintain physical distance for students is a huge challenge. While we work out those challenges, then we should take advantage of distance learning. And so, you know, the California Department of Education is doing its best to provide clarity to districts when they ask for help. Uh, you know, we've done things that are, have not been done before. Like we literally convened each and every one of the county health officers together with county superintendents and others to talk through how to approach these decisions. The way everything is set up in our state, it favors and, 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 and points to local decision making. And I respect that, right? As you said, Senator, I'm a former school board member. I care deeply about local decision making and the way the way things have been set up is that uh, local boards and superintendents make decisions informed by local county health officers. I, I'll, I'll say this, but, but, I, but I'll say this. I acknowledge that we do need to provide more clarity from the state. Uh, there's no question of that. The state has responsibility to, uh, you know, do things like provide more personal protective equipment. And I'm grateful that, you know, uh, through our work with the governor's office and the Office of Emergency Services, um, personal protective equipment has been provided um, uh, for schools uh, for the, at least the first 60 days. And I should say I'm grateful that the legislature, that all of you legislators uh, have made that happen through the budget that you provided, especially in these tough times, that, um, that you provided resources uh, for these things and that there's money in the budget for distance learning. Uh, all that said, the state needs to do more. And as we speak, I know for a fact that the California Department of Public Health the, the experts on health matters are, are working around the clock to put out some new guidance, and, and we need it. We, we all need it. And, you know, and we, we, you know, at the Department of Education, we're trying to supplement that. We put out guidance with examples of how schools might reopen, um, about how to arrange class sizes and, you know, uh, what educators might do. And, by the way, it was informed by teacher groups and classified staff and administrators, uh, all of us working together. But on the health questions, this calls for more information, and uh, we're, we're trying to cobble that together while we wait for the Department of Public Health to put out its latest guidance, which we are told is imminently to be released. My sense is that this governor is facing probably one of the toughest challenges anywhere, is to figure out how to balance local decision-making but also safety. I, I know people are asking for more, and I think it's a fair request. More yeah. is needed. And, and I yeah. promise you this, Senator, no matter what, at the California Department of Education, we will continue to consult with districts to provide information. By the way, we're, we're organizing a meeting for all 1,000 of our school districts um, to be a part of a conversation with the California Department of Public Health so they can hear the latest guidance right away and they can ask questions because we know that they need it. Uh, I'll be able to give you that information to, to update the specific date and time soon, Senator. 
um, I just wanted you to know. And you know what, Senator, your district is hearing it first. You, uh, and the legislators on this call, you're hearing it first that we've arranged for there to be a direct meeting for all 1,000 school districts with the Department of Public Health to be able to get more information and guidance on health matters. Well, that's terrific. It's great to hear. And again, we appreciate your leadership on that. Uh, uh, Gabriel from uh, writes in with a question that I think many people have, and it's about the uh, announcements from the federal government about mandating openings of schools. Um, can you speak to that, uh, that, that, that voice that we've heard from the East that have somehow said that we must open our schools? What, what, what do you have to say about that? Is that for me, Senator? No, no that's a question from Gabriel. He wrote in. Oh, As you know, the yeah. president has indicated that, that he is insisting that schools open. Uh, any yeah. thoughts on, on that, uh, that pronouncement? Yeah, listen, this isn't about politics, but I'm going to say this, that I, I just think that the manner in which the president is saying it is just really, really doesn't take into account the, the lack of safety that we're seeing all around us. And, and, you know, I don't understand how the president can make a message that says, as we see all around us, everything is closing all around us how we could ignore the warning signs that suggest our children, our babies, could be at risk, and their educators, and their families, quite frankly, because we know that children might inadvertently um, infect their parents. And so I think that, uh, you know, with all due respect to the president's comments, I think now is the time for caution. Now is the time for safety, not inflammatory remarks like when the president says that he might cut funding for school districts, you know, because they don't open, I'm sorry, I just have to call it what it is. It's dangerous, it's reckless, and it's immoral to, to, to threaten, to cut funding to schools that actually actually need more funding. The message that I've been sending to, the, to our federal leaders, including the president's office, is don't make threats when people are trying to be safe. Rather, um, this is a time when we need more funding. Um, the state of California needs, like every other state, needs more funding. School is a key area. We need more money for uh, computing devices. We, had, we, we, know, we know going into this pandemic we had probably a million students who did not have access to the Internet. We know that we have many families, many of them from various backgrounds, who don't have a computer at home at all. And all the family members trying to get information from school, from life, from work, off of one cell phone, if that. And so, sorry, Senator, I do have a few thoughts about the question from Gabriel, and I do have a few <laughs> thoughts about the President's comments. You know, I, you know, my message back to the President is, you know, we're all struggling. Let's struggle together, but we need leadership, and we need resources that are going to get us through this. And, you know, I, I appreciate you, Senator, and the Assembly members on this call, uh, how we're all working together. Uh, these, there, there are no easy answers here. But we're in this together, and we are stronger together, and we'll do more together on behalf of our uh, 6 million students. Very well, very well said. Assemblywoman Bauer Kayan, you had a question? Yeah, I have a follow-up. And I want to thank you for your leadership, Superintendent, and all of the educators on this call, because you said that's what we need right now. Um, but I have a question. You mentioned that one of the metrics that we should be looking at, and I think this is right, I know our counties are looking at it for opening and rollbacks, is the percent of spread that we're seeing in the community. And um, locally, we've eclipsed 8% at our testing sites, which was sort of the metric our local county health had been looking at when discussing a question of rollback. Um, do you have a percent, a number, a metric that, or does public health, Department of Public Health, that we should be looking at to make these decisions about distance learning? or going back to the classroom? Assembly member, I, I'm not a doctor. I, I did play one once on TV, but I wouldn't pretend to, to say that I have the expertise um, to say what's the right metric. But I can tell you this, um, the California, uh, the, the Center for Disease Control has created some metrics that I, I, for when certain things can reopen. I think that there is a way for us to, to, to really extrapolate from that to create a metric for our schools. And what I've asked uh, the California Department of Public Health to do is to help us create a metric um, for schools to have clarity around when you're entering into the danger zone. And you might need to say, okay, let's start slowly. Let's open in distance learning. Let's monitor and be prepared to pivot into in-class instruction or when the conditions are okay. And so I know that the Department of Public Health is thinking about how to do this. They're having conversations about that. But as you point out, Assembly Member, I, I think that we've seen that for the last month, the rate of infection has increased dramatically. Um, 8% is pretty close to where Los Angeles County is, and they're about, last I checked, closer to 10%. 
And I believe that they made the right decision to say we're moving into distance learning. I know that Contra Costa County, and I know, Senator, you have Contra Costa and Alameda County, but I know that Contra Costa County is on, on, the, on the, the list of counties to watch. Many of the counties in the Bay Area are in that situation. I, I just think that now is the time for us to say let's move cautiously. If it helps the assembly member, I'd say this. Uh, the California Department of Education operates and, and supports three schools in our state. They serve wonderful students, um, deaf and blind students. One of them is in Fremont. One of them uh, is in Riverside. Actually, two are in Fremont. And, and you know, we've given, we've given parents at the school, we've said that we're going to open and distance learning to be safe. We're anticipating that at least for the first month that we'll open and distance learning. Our schools bring, our schools have a residential program where our students can stay at school. That means students come from almost 40 or 45 different counties. That in and of itself creates certain health risks. And so, you know, while we're not health experts, we, we, we just believe that we have to pay attention to a lot of these warning signs. And so we've made the decision to open and distance learning. We, but we're going to monitor the conditions. If things get better, um, we, we hope to be able to move back into in-person instruction. And the last thing I'll say on this assembly member is that some have said, that what we should look at as, a, as an indicator, um, and I believe some of this came from uh, the CDC's guidance. Some of this actually has been articulated in a letter from the California Federation of Teachers. Some have said that one type of metric that could work is seeing a decline in cases over a 14-day period. Um, you know, we're certainly we're engaging more health experts to help us get answers so that they get directed back to schools. So we'd certainly be open in that or any other metric that makes sense. Um, we, we didn't put one in our guidance because we didn't have the cases that we're seeing right now. We don't have the health expertise, but we're looking to make sure that there's an answer that schools are going to have and to make sure that they get that real soon, Assembly Member. Uh, Superintendent you. Thurman, I know you don't have much time left, but let me uh, we do a lightning round of a couple questions if we could. Uh, a uh, school yes, board member from Pleasanton writes in to ask about child nutrition programs. Are they going to be able to continue with remote learning? Uh, as the school year begins, any thoughts on child nutrition efforts? You, you know, I would say I would say that we could start by looking to what our experience was when we went into distance learning um, in March, and I am amazed at what our schools and our staff continue to do around all nutrition programs. I, you know, at the time, we had meals being distributed at more than five thousand. Uh, locations throughout the state. Uh, the Department of Education got all kinds of waivers from the state to make that as flexibly as as flexible as possible, because we know that for many of our young people, this is the only meal they may get. That's we right. have students That's right. who count on school for one, sometimes two, sometimes three meals a day, and so we've been working to get all kinds of waivers from the federal government. We've been trying to get even, you know, there's some money that the federal government's holding on that California should have. You know, it's sort of like it's sort of like being punished. They're like punishing us and saying, well, we normally reimburse you on the amount of meals you distribute, and that's how schools build their budget. And so because, of course, there'd be a few, uh, you know, a fewer meals because of the pandemic uh, and the difficulty to deliver, to provide the meals, that means that our school districts have actually gotten less money in their reimbursements, money that they need to be able to continue serving young people during the pandemic. And so I just want you to know that we're, you know, we're at the bat for our schools in, in, in Washington, D.C., to see how we can free up some of those unreimbursed dollars. Uh, I want to thank the Pleasanton School Board member and just let you know that um, our office will continue to provide guidance on how to distribute meals at all levels. Um, and uh, if you need any support, please reach out to us. We'd be happy uh, to provide it. And let me ask you this as we, as we sum up our conversation. Are there things that we in the legislature and the Senate and the Assembly can do to be more supportive of our schools? Are there roadblocks that you're finding and different programs you'd like to fund or support? Is there, is there things that we could uh, better partner with you on? Senator, thanks for asking that question. I think town halls like this are really important. They help us to together, um, you know, get the word out to families and answer questions. And I just have to applaud all of the superintendents and districts that you have on this call, because a lot of times when I get on the town on these town halls, you know, most of it, you know, everything's local, and they always say politics are all local, but nothing is more important and localized than your local educational needs. And I just have to say that your local superintendents are doing a great job. Uh, your local educators, both teachers and classified staff, they're doing a great job. They have, they tend to have the information 
that your constituents want better than what we can answer because everything is so kind of localized. But we'll always join these these town halls because it helps us to hear what people are looking for. Um, if you hear things from your from your school district senator and from your constituents, the way you bubble them up to me, the text messages, even the text messages are helpful because we need to have that information so that we can go and advocate, you know, with the Department of Finance and the, and the governor's office. Senator, I think when we when we lock up together, you know, like you and the two assembly members, you know, on this call, we can go to the governor together. We can go to the Department of Finance and just it's not that they don't want to help, but I think they need to have the specific context. People need to know that counseling programs are really hard to find right now. When we went into the pandemic, most of our counseling programs that do school-based mental health and, and school-based health, and they rely on programs like Medi-Cal, they weren't able to serve students because they didn't have that direct contact. That meant they weren't able to build. A lot of these are community-based organizations that were at risk of closing their doors. The same thing was happening to after-school programs. And because of the work of this legislature, we were able to keep funding in place so those after-school programs could keep their doors open and some of those mental health organizations could keep their doors open. But right now, I, I think it was the superintendent that, that last spoke. I don't know if it was uh, Lafayette. I, I might have missed the district. But uh, it right now, I'm sorry, for Pittsburgh, right now for districts, as we prepare to go back into distance learning potentially, the need for counseling is going to be greater than ever. Our students experienced a high rate of suicide and depression during, the, during um, being in distance learning. And without resources, you know, to address counseling directly, uh, to do outreach when kids don't check in, I think that's what the superintendent was talking about. You know, I've created a kind of ad hoc counseling coalition where I'm asking all the counseling and uh, psychology groups to come together to help us fill the gaps because we can't let what happened before happened again.